Hashem Hu Elohim, Hashomayim, Nimal. Ki Hashem Hu Elohim, Hashomayim, Nimal. Ve'alor et eino. coming. Good evening. Tonight's uh, class. Uh, so we have a few dedications. The CD this week was dedicated by our dear friend Velvel Zickman. <coughs> and this is in honor of his mother, whose yard site is going to be on Sunday, I think, Matzah Shabbos, the 25th of Shvat, Dina Rezel, Bas Yitzchak Aaron, Allah HaShalom. May her neshama have a very great aliyah to the greatest of heights. May she channel lots and lots of blessings to you for all that you need and all that you want in the material and in the spiritual. Uh, much, much blessings. Thank you so much. Another dedication we have this week is even though I didn't get confirmation, but I'm assuming we're, we're going to go ahead with this dedication and if for whatever reason it doesn't work out from from the dedicator, then it's going to be our dedication over here from Maya. Uh, the Roth family, Mr. 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 and Mrs. Um, Zalman and Esther Roth, always dedicate this class, the, the CD, and the class uh, almost all the years in honor of Mrs. Roth's mother's yard site, which is tonight, Sheva Bas Yitzchak Isaac, Allah Shalom, on the 21st of Shvat. Um, this year, um, there was an accident in the family, and Shem should protect. They had to travel. Um, a family member got hurt, and they're out of the country. So I couldn't reach them. Uh, but the, the daughter, Nidza Rafua Shalema, is named for her mother. So extra, extra, extra bracha. So for Sheva Bas Yitzchak Isaac, your mother, she should have Aliyah Neshama to the greatest of heights. And from that very, very, very high, 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 lofty place where the blessings are infinite and anything is possible, she should draw down a great blessing for your daughter, Sheva Bas Esther Hensha, that she should have a complete, 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 complete Rufuah Shalema, almost a magical recovery. Unbelievable. I hear Baruch Hashem things are getting better. May it be a complete, 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 complete recovery and all other brachas for the entire Roth family and all that they need and all that they want. Um, last, there is a dedication tonight uh, by my dear friend Rabbi Naftali Astulin. And this is in honor of his mother's yard site, Rezel Bas Chaim Avram, that's taking place on Sunday night, the 26th of Shvat. Now, Rabbi Astulin. Uh, told me a story of his mother that he would like me to share, and it's such a great story that I'd love to share it. Le'ili Nishma says, Mom, uh, the uh, students <coughs> were in Russia, and uh, they were in the brutal time under the communist regime, and uh, had a very, very, very hard time. They managed to come out miraculously. Uh, when, after she came out, his mom, uh, with her fa with his father, um, she received a letter from her sister who was back in Russia. 
and uh, telling them of the situation. It wasn't easy to write a letter and to, and to be able to write even, because uh, they, would, they would censure things and look at things. So it was very kind of, it was not so easy to even, even communicate. But she basically gave, sent a heartbreaking letter of how the, her situation is really, really dire and desperate. See, for the people who wanted to keep Shabbos and keep Torah and Mitzvahs, it was almost impossible. You literally almost starved to death. In addition to that, um, you know, for not sending the kids to school, they made it horrible. They made it life was beyond miserable. And I think her husband was in, was 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 in jail, or was then released, or he was in jail. But he, it, and they they told the family, they told the 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 KGB, told the family that you should shouldn't even dream of leaving. You're gonna rot here, over here in 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 Russia. You guys are gonna rot forever. And those were such harsh words, and they were very heartbroken when they received that that information that they're not they shouldn't even think ever of leaving Russia because it's never gonna happen. It caused them tremendous pain, and they sent a letter here, and her sister received it. She was very heartbroken. She went into the Lubavitcher Rebbe for a, for a blessing, and when she came into Yechidis for private audience, she broke down crying. And the Rebbe asked her, Was Vainstu, why are you crying? So she related to the Rebbe about her sister and how the Russians told her that they're going to rot in Russia and they're never going to come out. So the Rebbe says to her, the Rebbe says, if you would listen to them, would you be here? If you're going based on their words, what the KGB says, would you be in the United States of America now? Would you be outside of Russia? Obviously no. So obviously what happened? A miracle happened. And that's how you came out. It's only that what? That you, they didn't speak such harsh words to you, like they spoke to your sister. In other words, to your sister, they, they, they let her have it. They said, you know, you're going to rot. To you, they never said such words. So for you, it was a small miracle. And for your sister and her family, it's needed a larger miracle, a bigger miracle. So you tell me, this is the Rebbe Sester, you tell me, for God, is it a difference, a big miracle or a small miracle? Does it make a difference to God? Obviously not. That's what the Rebbe said to her. Six months later, her family was out. Out of Russia. Well, that was the story that he told me. Just a very, very powerful story. Any case, we are now ready to begin Parshas Mishpatim class. I will uh, admit that I had a little bit of a uh, confusing day and I didn't get a chance to give, to give the uh, appropriate preparation. So I don't know if this, is the, if this is the class or this is the preparation for the class. But <laughs> either way, um, it's going it's, uh, you know, to be good. Okay. Um, this week's Torah portion deals with the the, this is a week after, the last week's Torah portion, we read about the giving of the Torah, about the great event at Sinai, the great godly revelation, and the Ten Commandments. And this week's Torah portion begins, Ha-Mishpatim, and these are the laws, Ashatasim Lifneim, that you should place before them. And here God continues instructing the Jewish people about a whole bunch of laws. The laws that we are, are going to learn in this week's Torah portion is civil law. Primarily, all about arguments and debates, and or arguments and 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 um, disputes that people have with each other, in which they come to the court to litigate the dispute, and all kinds of damages and so on and so forth. It's a unique kind of law because these are laws that make sense. They're logic. They're not. This is not religious law. See, the laws of mishpatim is not religious law. It's civil law in which it's similar actually to other civil law that there is in other civil societies. Um, and that's why, but yet, these are the Torah law. And the opening words of the Eilah Mishpatim is, the Eilah Mishpatim, and, it, the Torah portion begins with the word and. And that's a little difficult, you usually don't write and at the beginning of a paragraph, you, and is in the middle, not at the beginning. But if you hear the end, it's telling you that this is a continuation to previous. And that is to teach us that law, that we shouldn't take these laws and think, okay, that this is the Torah being human. 
the Torah, in the last week Torah portion, the Torah is being godly, is being divine. And here, God is giving us human law, human logic. Uh, we have to know that, no, our law that we have, the Jewish civil law, is different than the Gentile non-Jewish civil law. Is that our Jewish civil law originates at Sinai. Which means this too is divine. And this too comes from God. And therefore, Rashi tells us, that when you have a litigation with a dispute with another fellow Jew, it could be a matter, any matter in your life. You know, something was stolen and you have someone that you're accusing for theft and it's another Jew. Or it is some other kind of damage that you want to sue someone for damages that incurred as a result of their negligence or whatever it is. You should go to a Beit Din. You should go to a Jewish court. You should not bring the person to a to a non-Jewish court, you should go to a Jewish court for litigation. And the reason is because you want to be judged by a godly law and not be judged by a human law. And Rashi takes it so far. Even in a case where you know that the civil law, the way they are judging it in, in the law, because you're a lawyer and you know the laws as it is written, let's say in the United States uh, or California law, Let's say you know it's the exact same law as the law is decided in Shulchan Aruch, the same like the Talmudic law. And therefore you know that the conclusion is going to be the same. So if you realize that God wants this person to pay so and so for the damage that they've done, and they're actually going to be given the same amount that they would have been taken, and the same litigation that's going to be, or the same verdict that's going to be given like it would be given in a Jewish court, so what's the difference who you go to? So Rashi says no. You still have to take it to a Jewish law. Why? Because you have to recognize that these laws are coming from God and therefore we as Jews are living in a godly space, in a higher space. And therefore even our aspects that are governing our everyday, everyday civil life in which we are governing all the aspects of our life are also connected to the incredible godly revelation at Sinai. That's the idea which we see. So we see over here that we're dealing with what kind of law? Laws that are so logical, that are making so much sense, that to the point that it's possible that the Gentile courts are going to come to the same conclusions like the Torah law. That's how, that's how logical it is. And that's, the, and that's what this Torah portion deals with, which is kind of a little bit of a downer, because we just received communication with God. We just had moment of such spiritual ecstasy we would have hoped that right after the giving of the Torah we would learn some esoteric Kabbalah Kabbalah right we learn Kabbalah give me Kabbalah give me give me Jewish give me deep mysticism and now we're gonna why are we now talking about such down-to-earth subjects and such down-to-earth logic and reason in which I don't even have to receive it from Torah I can receive it from from uh, from Anybody, even, even, even if I go to the local courthouse, this would be the way of thinking of the Gentile judge. It would be kind of strange. So why, is the, we, why do we have such law? But over here we have to realize that in Parshas Mishpatim there is something extremely, extremely powerful. And something amazingly deep. And that has to do with the idea that I just mentioned before. If this would just be down-to-earth human logic, so why in the world are we connecting it to the revelation at Sinai? Why is the Torah beginning with the word and these are the laws? And what difference does it make if I, take the, if, I, if I litigate at a Jewish court or if I litigate at a non-Jewish court? What's the difference? If it's, to say, if it's just the law. As we mentioned earlier, this is not just the law. This is divine. But what is unique about Parshas Mishpatim? What's unique about this week's Torah portion is the mergence the merging together of the divine and the human. God's merging with our human minds, with our understanding. We spoke last week in the class, the whole idea of the giving of the Torah is to enable God to descend into our world and live comfortably in our reality. And when a person studies Torah, they, their mind becomes a vessel for God to enter. And God kind of is assimilated into our, into our life and into our being, and we become unified with Him. Now, when you're studying Torah, but this Torah that you're studying, 
remains a little bit mystical and above and abstract and above your head, then the emergence of you and it are not complete. The way you're studying is it by surrendering your mind and accepting certain spiritual ideas. But what does that mean? It means that the concepts are aloof. They're above you. They're godly. They're not you. The beauty of Parshas Mishpatim is that God is coming down so, so, so low, low. He is formulating himself into a formula that the human mind can apprehend and conceive and understand and understand it so well that at a certain point you don't even realize that this is divine law. You start thinking that this is human law. This is logic. But what does that really mean? What that really means is that Hashem is enabling you to merge with Him on your terms, meaning in a level that is so, so, so much us, so much of our, of our, of our brains, of our humanity, of our human side. God is permeating our, our, our human intellect and our human mind thoroughly and completely. So we are becoming so holy and we are becoming so godly. And that's the ultimate fusion of God and the world, precisely with these laws. However, it is important that we always bear in mind that when it becomes, when the law becomes so normal and neutral and regular in our mind, and that that these godly ideas become so, so tangible and so much part of our regular thinking, that we don't lose the sense that this is really divine. And that's what the Torah is instructing us. Don't think of it as just plain human logic. Always recall and understand the divinity, the godliness, the infinite light, the infinite energy of God that is contained in these laws. Even though it's packaged and it is, const- and it is, and it is brought down in a way that it is... Me- God is only doing you a favor, so to speak, by making himself so down to earth so that we can grasp him and unify with him in a way that is so internalizable, so, 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 so much us, and in a way that we can, can really, really absorb it in a very, very deep way. That's the reason. To take this a step deeper, and really take this a step deeper, and the idea is as follows, a very, very powerful idea. And that is that the true reason why the world, the world that thousands of years ago looked very, very, very much like a jungle in terms of humanity and people associating and interacting, social life between people and people, between governments and governments, between tribes and tribes, was literally barbaric. The reason why the world has become so civilized and so advanced in terms of its ability to be able to coexist and harmony one with each other, we still have a way to go. We're not yet completely, completely there, but the unbelievable advance of the world to be, of of humanity, to be able to create a civilization where people get along. There are criminals still, and there are some bad guys, and there are some bad governments, and there are some corrupt governments, but overall, for the 8 billion people that live in this planet, this world is a far more pleasant place to live in than 100 years ago, than 300 years ago, than 1,000 years ago, than 2,000 years ago, than 5,000 years ago. Way, 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 way better. And the reason is because man's thinking, human, human, humans made progress in their ability to understand and to appreciate how to coexist with each other, how to live with each other. That, and that came from what? From all this, all this, what we might say, civil law that was, ad- that was developed. The way it is decided amongst people. The basis of coexistence. The basis of, cohesive, of cohesiveness between people and people. Set the stage, right, of, 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 of the way life is governed. All of this came about as a result of the giving of the Torah. The giving of the Torah by God, and not only God, but here's the beauty of it. You say, well, 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 if it's all the giving of the Torah, so why doesn't everybody realize that the, the Torah is so great, and that God is the one who kind of enforced His rule over the world, and made the world civilized? 
if you'll ask a professor of law, uh, they won't necessarily admit that all of this is based on godly law. It's a Torah law. It's, it's the way humans have developed. Humans have developed with a conscience and humans have developed with a sense of, co- of, of co- co- coexistence and the like, and we figured out a way that works. The reason why the divine is hidden in all of this is precisely because if it would be God instructing and enforcing himself, his, his ideals, his, his way of thinking, his, his perfect world upon us, then it would never truly be us. We inherently would be animals, but we would be kind of, in, we would be under this powerful, powerful force that would compel us to behave in a, in a way that is other to our natural selves. So therefore, how does God influence human, human thinking that we reach a state of perfect civilization, of perfect harmonious existence, of per- perfect brotherhood, so to speak, amongst the into- all the eight billion people that there are on the planet, that people live to coexist and live in a, in a, in a just, in a world of, of, of justice, in a world of, 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 of fairness as a like, and the, li- the like, that, the way God influences mankind is in a very, 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 very subtle way. The subtlety of it is in a manner in which he's kind of prodding our minds and prodding the human consciousness to develop itself in a way that it's not even realizing that it's being prodded and it's being pushed along and advanced by a divine code of law. See what I'm saying? It's not in a way in which it's being forced. It's being done in which God plants ideas in the cosmos. He plants ideas in the universe. And people and creates thinking patterns. It creates certain ways of 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 society, um, um, understanding, progressing in the way in which it makes sense for people. Certain ideas, certain certain um, 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 values, value systems, certain uh, rights that a, that a human being has: the right to live, the right to practice their 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 you know their their their. Uh, their, their religion, or the right, all these things that have kind of become part of mankind's, mankind's advance. These are all ideas that the Torah kind of has influenced and put into the world. And by Hashem bringing His will, which essentially is utterly godly, infinitely beyond any form of logic, because this is Hashem Himself, it's totally, the Torah is totally one with Him. By God, the contracting his infinite will and desire into a system of divine logic, which is the Torah. The Torah is a system of godly logic in which God lowers his desire and want into that system of logic. That system, and by giving that logic to the Jewish people, and the Jewish people studying that over three millennia, and practicing that in their lives in this world, they create ripple waves and effects into the rest of humanity. Now, it doesn't mean that every person in the world is going to behave absolutely synchronized with the Torah, but it means in a very, very great way, there's great, there's great um, strides made in the overall development of mankind to live based on the essential precepts and values that the Torah sets for the world. So it comes out according to this, the reason why it makes sense in people's minds that thou shalt not kill, and that is wrong. The reason why there is makes sense in peace, people's minds certain basic ideas of morality, of marriage and the like, that have been conceived in the mind of the, of, of the global consciousness. The reason why there is an understanding in the, in, in the global consciousness that a person is responsible for their acts, for their behavior. And if, God forbid, someone causes damage to someone else, they're responsible and they have to, be pay, and they have to pay. It was not the way people lived 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 years ago. It didn't exist. The mighty ruled. Whoever was stronger took advantage of the weaker. That's the way it was. There was no accountability. There was no... The reason why this came about is because the Torah for thousands of years 
has been drip, 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 dripping slowly like a person receiving a, a IV drip. It was slowly dripping and dripping and dripping onto the collective consciousness of humanity, creating certain understandings and creating certain ideas. The reason is because the Torah is the blueprint through which God created the world. When God created the world, God created the world based on the Torah. So therefore, when the Torah has a certain way of thinking, a certain logic, a certain idea, a certain value system that the Torah sees is the way people ought to live, that value system eventually, it's not immediately, but eventually becomes the universal value system that impacts all of the world. And obviously, it, it, it shows up in different countries, in different societies, stronger. And then mankind advances. It doesn't happen everywhere at the same time. There is an advance, there is a progression. This idea that Torah becomes assimilated into the human consciousness, not only into the Jewish consciousness, but into the vast universal Gentile world, this idea, that's the novelty of Parshas Mishpat, of this week's Torah portion. Last week's Torah portion, we have a revelation of God, we have a people that are dedicate themselves with excitement, they want to surrender themselves, they want, to, they want to be spiritual, they want to be connected. Great, wonderful, that's great. But it's all lofty, it's all above the world, it's not regular, it's not, the, it's not this physical world. The beauty of Pashas Mishpatim is that eventually the world synchronizes itself completely with God. So much so that the world becomes so decent, so moral, so based on a system of values that they can even question, why do we need God? We have a system that's correct and fair and right. Not realizing that it came from God. That's why Hashem reminds us in the Torah, this week's Torah portion, remember, remember the divine origins of all these laws. It's like the, the, gen, the idea that we find sometimes that when we speak about the uniqueness of the Jewish people and the specialty of the Jewish people, of how Hashem chose the Jewish people to be a special people and so on and so forth. And a lot of Jews have a very, very, very big objection to the notion that the Jew Jewish people are different. And they just don't, don't like it. They, it causes an, a severe allergic reaction by many, many Jews to the uniqueness of the Jewish people. And it's like one of the hardest things to overcome when you're trying to present Torah to, 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 to the world and to Jewish people that are, are, are uh, at this point, at, 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 you know, for the time being, yet still alienated from the Torah. They have a very hard time because this goes against the basic rules of equality and so on and so forth. So one of the ideas that, that, that um, I once heard was just a really, really phenomenal idea. The reason why we have such a hard time, Jews have such a hard time with accepting the idea of, there is an, of the great separation and divide that there is in the uniqueness of the Jewish people is because the non-Jewish world became so Jewish. After thousands of years, we made the entire world Jewish. I don't mean technically Jewish. I mean value Jewish thinking. And as a result of that, so why is the Jew different? I mean, the non, my my non-Jewish neighbor is not is not the type of person like that I meant the, 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 the Gentile that we encountered 200 years ago in Ukraine and in Russia. It's a whole different type of a person. A person full of generosity and kindness and has ambitions to do good for the world and so on and so forth. So these Jewish qualities and these Jewish ideals of world peace and, and empathy and caring for all of humanity and to try to make the world a better place and, and all this philanthropy and all these ideas which are very, very, very powerful core Jewish values became so natural and normal to the rest of the world. Well, that's your Mashiach world. That's Mashiach. Mashiach is when the whole world becomes so Jewish in, in, these, in these cores. That effect of that Jewishness that I'm talking about is the impact of Parshas Mishpatim. Parshas Mishpatim has that effect. So if you take a look, interesting, towards the end of the Torah portion, you find also this concept, this assimilation, this unification of the human mind to be consistent with, and, it's, and it doesn't realize that it is 
thinking that way based on a godly influence, but rather thinks that it has reached those conclusions based on its own uh, logic. But you find this, this idea of this total, total impact, this powerful effect, emergence of the divine and the world, which is the ultimate purpose of creation. We find that in the end of the Torah portion. It says in the end of the Torah portion that Vayechzu es Elohim, in the end, it, it repeats, it goes, at the end of Pashas Mishpatim, it goes back to the experience of Har Sinai, of Sinai. And over there it says that God revealed himself, Vayechzu es Elohim, and it says that the, the people that, by the giving of the Torah, there were those who came close and they were looking at God, they were staring at God, and they were eating and drinking. And it was considered a sin, and they should have died, now, it doesn't mean they were, they, they were eating popcorn while God was on the mountain. That's not what it means. Rashi says they were eating and drinking means that they had such pleasure and delight when they were watching and, and seeing the godly revelation that they lost a tiny bit of the awe and the fear that they should have had. And that was considered a blemish for these great holy saintly people that they were lacking in the respect that they should have had. They were a little too comfortable in the revelation. That's the story as it is in the negative side. But every story has a deeper meaning and a deeper meaning. The concept that they looked at God and they ate and they drink. That's what the Pasuk says, And then it also describes how God appeared to them. God appeared to them like, like a person sitting and his feet were on a... on tachas raglov and beneath his feet... Kamai say live nasa sapir. There was like sapphire bricks. That was the vision that they had. That a vision of Hashem's feet on top of sapphire bricks. So, what is the deeper meaning of this vision? The deeper meaning of this vision, conveying what we had mentioned earlier, the fact that they can eat, they can, they can perceive the divine, look at the divine, and eat and drink. The concept of that means that the absolute, hidden, abstract secrets of the godly, of the divine, became so absorbable, it became so understandable to them, that they were, it was considered like eating and drinking. When you eat and you drink something, when you eat food, what happens with the food and the drink that you drink? You take it in, and the food that you eat become you. They become completely integrated in the body, they become your blood, they become your flesh, they become your bones, they become your body. They had a divine vision, and we would think, you know, they're human, and human is temporary, finite, limited, and God is infinite, eternal, forever. As the Zohar says, there's no thought that can grasp him. So the secrets to be, when a prophet, for instance, had a prophecy, they generally had to like have an extra out-of-body experience. Their bodies would like kind of, they would, they would go into a state of extreme convulsions. Then for maybe even they would fall faint on the floor. Their souls would kind of ascend above their body. And in that experience, they would experience the vision of God. That's the way it was. Because that, what do you mean? How can a human being experience what angels can't perceive? And angels... But here, the beauty of, the, of, of this moment of the giving of the Torah was, since God desires to have a home in this world, since God wants to marry us and be in a complete relationship with us, and it began by the giving of the Torah, there was a moment of complete fusion of God and the world to the point they saw the deepest secrets, they, can, they beheld the, the God Himself, and at the same time, in what way did they interpret it? How did they perceive it? Like eating and drinking. It's the concept that what we spoke many times, the teachings of Hasidus before Mashiach comes are taught to us in a way that everyday laymen, everyday ordinary people can learn the secrets that Rabbi Shimon Ba Yochai studied. You see, it once was a time years ago that in order to study these secrets and to understand them even, one would need to be a tzaddik that fasted and did all kinds of mortifications and purified and purified and purified himself and reached the ultimate, ultimate state of, of refinement and dip himself in a freezing cold mikveh 
Like, and like, that's what the holy tzaddikim did, live in a cave and eat carobs for, for 15 years and nothing else. That's what, the, and then with that, that refinement to the point that the body was almost not a body anymore. It became like spirit. Then they could conceive secrets of the Torah. Today, children can study the secrets of the Torah through Hasidut. Hasidus gives us the deepest secrets, the deepest secrets of, of the Zohar, of the Rav Shem in a way that we can study, we can understand, and an average person, even a person who didn't study much Torah, the Zohar says that right before Mashiach comes, the secrets of the Torah are going to be spilled everywhere, and people are going to know them. That's the idea. The ability for our minds to merge. That's also the concept of the bricks. It says in Kabbalah that, that it says in Kabbalah that stones and bricks, in Hasidus, rather I should say, it speaks about the difference between stones and bricks. Stones and bricks, bricks, bricks are also stones. The difference between bricks and stones is that bricks are, bricks are man-made stones. And stones are original stones. God made stones and man made stones. So stones in general represent language, words. Because just like words and language is made up of a bunch of letters, you put letters together, and that's how you create sentences, and sentences turn into paragraphs, and paragraphs turns into, into chapters, and you write a whole story. So too, you put a few stones together, you create a wall, another wall, and so on and so forth. You have a building, and so on and so forth. The con- concept that letters are stones. But there's two types of stones. There is God-made stones, and those are the letters coming from God. That's called Lashon HaKodesh, the holy tongue. The holy tongue, Hebrew, the holy tongue. And then there is man-made stones, those are all the other languages. Today's days, you can study the deepest secrets of the Torah in English. You can study the deepest secrets of the Torah in French and in Spanish. That's the idea that under God's feet, there were bricks of sapphire. Sapphire represent the idea that it's brilliant, it's clean, it's as clean as can be. It's shining. But these shining bricks are made... I remember, and I still know, a previous generation of Jews who the notion, when you're teaching Torah in general, and especially if you're teaching esoteric ideas, chasidus, deep ideas, and you're teaching it in English, would give them a heart attack. Because to them it was so profane. That's like profanity. How do you take these secrets? These things are meant to be given over in the holy tongue, at best in Yiddish, because Yiddish is considered a mediating language between Lush and Akodesh and other languages. It's a very essentially Jewish language. In such a language, you speak, you speak such holy words. In English? That's so coarse. How can you take, it's almost like you're contaminating its holiness by making it so, so, so worldly. But the purpose of creation is the exact opposite. That God's truth should permeate everywhere and everything completely. And therefore, under his feet, there are bricks, not stones, bricks. Bricks are man-made words, other languages, but they're filled with godly light. This is the whole concept of Parshas Mishpat. The ability for the ultimate emergence of Hashem in the world. Now, interesting idea it is as follows. When we look... Parshas Mishpatim is a parsha in the Chumash, in the Torah, which is the written Torah. But there's also what we call Torah Shabal Peh. And Torah Shabal Peh is, Torah Shabal Peh is the oral law. And what is the, what is the, and, and the Torah Shabal Peh, the oral law is a commentary or an explanation on the written law. So in Torah Shabal Peh, the laws of Parshas Mishpatim make up a tractate. The tractate that they make up is what we call the tractate Baba Kama. I'm sorry, Seder Nezikin. There is a tractate in the Torah or a, in, in the Shas, in the Talmud, there is a Mesechta called Mesechtas Nezikin. Now for most people who are familiar with Gemara, will say there is no Mesechta called Mesechtas Nezikin. There is a Seder called, a whole section called Nezikin. But there is no Mesechta, there is no tractate Nezikin. However, the Gemara says, that really there is a tractate called tractate Nezikin. Nezikin means damages. And um, it only it has 
it was because it was such a large tractate, because it's such a thick, it would have been such a thick volume, it would be such a thick masechta, they divided it into three tractates. Baba Kama, Baba Metziah, and Baba Basra. Which Baba Kama means the first gate, Baba Metziah means the middle gate, and Baba Basra means the third gate. Which means they took one, basically this tractate is civil law. That's what the tractate is. And most of the tractate is built on the verses of Parshas Mishpatim, of our two. But it's divided into three parts. The first one is Nezikin. I'm sorry, the first one is Baba Kama. And the second was the first gate. The second one, Baba Metziah, the second gate. And Baba, Baba Basra, the last gate. If we look at the content, now, you, on the simple level, the reason why it was divided into three is just because it's, it would have been such a thick book even today, Baba Basra is a thick book. You don't really want to let that thing drop on your foot. It's a very thick book. But if you would put them all three together, it would be just, you know, too big. To, or to say to a student, study the whole thing, you would get overwhelmed. But if you divide it, you sectionize it into three sections. But if we think about it deeper, we realize that these three mesechtas have three, they, these three parts of this one mesechta have within themselves Three levels of law. Very, very far. far, far. Let's take a look. Baba Kama deals with, Baba Kama, the first portal, the first um, uh, gate, deals with laws pertaining to damages, where one person or one, uh, where there is is a a, uh, possibility of serious serious, uh, damage or infliction or we might, let's put it this way. Baba Kama deals with criminal activity. Either overtly criminal activity, theft and robbery, or extreme negligence that leads to damage, which can also be considered to a certain degree criminal. So for example, if a person has a wild animal or a pit bull, and he's not careful with that pit bull, right, that dog, and the dog goes and harms someone else, bite someone, hurt someone. So that's what the responsibility is. That's part of what it talks about. The Gemara is not talking about a wild dog. The Talmud is talking about a wild bull, actually. Uh, that, that, right? Or the damages that concur when your animals go into someone else's property and damage their food and so on and so forth. Or when someone makes a fire and he doesn't guard his fire and the fire goes out. So the beginning of Tractate Baba Kama deals with four different types of damages, four primary categories of damages. One is an animal that damages... The other one is um, damages coming from a person himself. The other one is making a pit, which means any kind of hazard that a person makes in public domain. Like you make a pit or you leave something, and as a result of what a person left, it caused damage. And the last one is a fire, which the idea of a fire means you created something in a legal way, in your own, but because when, if you're not careful with it, it can go out and it can harm other people. So these are four different types of damages, and including... In addition to that, Tractate Baba Kama deals with the laws as I mentioned earlier of theft and robbery. So if you think about it, the entire book of Masechtas Baba Kama is a book dealing with criminal litigation, but having to do civil limit litigation at the criminal side of end of things. Masechtas Baba Metziah is a whole different category. Tractate Baba Metziah deals with arguments and disputes that people have not from a, not where anybody is being malicious or anybody wants to or did anything harmful to the other. It's just in the course of everyday living, there will come up disputes and arguments between people. An employer and an employee have a dispute about payment. He did the job. He didn't do the job completely. No one over here acted maliciously and so on and so forth. It's very possible that they both think they're absolutely right. They have an argument. Two people saw a lost object. They both ran and they both picked it up at the same time. This guy said, I found it. The other guy said, he found it. There's no damage over here. There's no criminal activity. But there is an argument. There is a fight. The two people are really upset at each other. They're coming to, for litigation and so on and so forth. Or you have the four guardians. You give something to guard to someone to watch your property. And, which is actually discussed also in this week's Torah portion, and something happened, what is the degree of responsibility? Over here too, you have the litigation of the argument of the two, the two, the two, parties, two parties who are arguing and coming to court. That is the laws of the second 
part. Again, it's not criminal, it's not malicious, but there's still a fight, an argument going on, a dispute about who's right and who's in the wrong, and so on and so forth. Tractate the Baba Basra, which is the last and final gate, the last and final gate of this Seder called Seder Nezikin, deals with laws that govern the way we set the stage for coexistence between, between different between people. For instance, it begins with the laws of neighbors or two people, two people that are partners in a certain house or in a field and so on and so forth, and they decide that they want to split. So what's the way that they can build the wall? Who's responsible for the wall? How do they build it? They both have to build the wall. They're both going to join together. So it's giving instructions of how they're going to go about and live in this coexistence. So you're not dealing with any argument. You're not dealing with a fight. It's giving you, when, it's giving you the laws of a sale. When you're selling something, what are the laws? What's included in the sale? What's not included in the sale? If I sell you my house, is the refrigerator part of the sale? Is it not part of the sale? The, uh, the, 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 the um, what are they called? Not the utensils. The, uh, the, uh, uh? no, the large, the large, these uh, utilities. If the utilities are looking for the utilities, if they're part of it, if they're not part of it, and the like. So these are, or inheritance, how are you going to divide a, a property? There is no argument, there is no fight over here. The Torah is originally creating a system. A system in which we can live and remain friends and live in a happy way as a society needs to have laws, so on and so forth. So if you take a look at really these three mesechtas, you see that there is a progression. That progression is you have the blatant, criminal, extreme form of damage where humans can hurt other people, either themselves or their property. Then you have disputes and arguments and fights with people, but they're far more subtle. We're not, and then finally you have the ultimate objective of law is not to settle fights and disputes or to punish criminals. The ultimate objective of law is to set a certain standard, to set a certain way of living that people can live together in a beautiful world. And no one will fight. And everybody will appreciate the rights and, and limitations and boundaries that other people have. And so we will live together. So really, these three tractates, and this is really based on a Zohar, that these three tractates that there are can be seen as the progression of humanity to its ultimate, to its ultimate state. In other words, if we go back in the beginning of history, we go back at the beginning of the world, as we mentioned, the beginning of the class, was a jungle where there was a lot of, there were entire, the, the entire world, society was criminal. Governments were, were criminal. And that's the, and, more than, and no one objected because that was the understanding of the way life works. If I'm stronger than you, I can attack you, I can steal all your property. So, so, so without any other reason, there were great conquerors. Alexander the Great was, an, was, was, was heralded as one of the greatest conquerors in the world. And he was written about as an awesome human being. Why? Because he conquered and he plundered and he stole everybody and basically took everything from whoever he wanted because he had such a mighty army. And that's what historians wrote as greatness. Not as... Today's days, if someone decided, you know, if, if, if a country decides to attack another country just because they're stronger and they're mightier and therefore take away uh, what they have, you have an outcry. The whole world is crying, screaming. How can you do that? So you see, there was a world, there was an ancient world, there was a Babakama world. Then from the world of Babakama, we come to the next stage where humanity progresses. And there are fights and there are arguments and there are disputes between people, there are disputes between governments, and so on and so forth. And for that we need to have the Torah and the law to be able to sort things out, to come to a way of understanding in which we can resolve our fights and we can resolve our conflicts. But eventually the ultimate purpose of the law of Seder Nezikin, and in a sense we can say that Seder Nezikin really represents, Nezikin means damages, it represents the concept of the Jewish people being in exile. The exile of the Jewish people amongst the nations. 
is a certain, has a purpose. The purpose of that exile is to bring about a certain rectification, to bring about a purification, to bring about a rehabilitation in the world, a fixing of humanity. And that fixing goes through, goes through stages. First, we're encountering a world that is extremely rough, a world that is extremely hostile, a world that is barbaric. And from there, the performance, the objective of Torah law, of studying the Torah and the mitzvahs, and, to, and, and as Jews live amongst the, 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 the greater society, these ideas of the way the Torah resolves every conflict, and the way the Torah gives the, 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 the understanding of, the, of its true values, and in the way the Torah sees the, the, and appreciates the, 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 and respects the individual, and so on and so forth, this slowly but surely chips away and transforms humanity, chips away at the klipa, at the ugliness, and transforms bit by bit. From Baba Bakama, we come to Baba Metziah, which means from the first portal, a world full of conflict and war, we come to a world where there is still disputes, but a world that is working its way to the ultimate state, which is Baba Basra, which is the complete world, harmonious existence, where people realize that we have the ability as humanity to live without a conflict, to live in harmony and in peace, which is really the Messianic age. That's the progress. Sefer Nezikin, Parshas Mishpatim, is the Parsha moving the world to its ultimate state. In 1992, on Parshas Mishpatim, um, the Lubavitcher Rebbe spoke a, an amazing talk. An amazing talk. And one that was like, it's, 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 it's like never, I think, in the history of the world was such words spoken. In which the Rebbe then pointed to an interesting thing. He said, that Friday, I don't have the English date, I didn't get a chance to look it up, as I mentioned to you, I had a little bit of a hectic day. That Friday, Friday, Erev Shabbos, Friday, Parshas, Erev Shabbos, in 1992, um, the date was Chav, the Hebrew date was Chav Vav Shvat, 26th day of Shvat. There was a, 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 a um, great meeting of uh, the president, I think it was president, I don't think it was Reagan, Reagan wasn't in power, was already after Reagan days, I think it was President Bush, with the, his Russian counterpart, whether it was Gorbachev, or maybe it was the guy after Gorbachev, this was before Putin, I forgot already who it was, who was the next, Yeltsin. Maybe it was Yeltsin or maybe it was Gorbachev, I think it was Yeltsin, in which they came together and they signed a nuclear non-proliferation um, act, in which we're going to tone down that, that, that the, the true the two uh, world powers that until then engaged in a cold war in which each of them tried to outdo the other one with nuclear weapons, which of course nuclear weapons is a tremendous threat to, the, to civilization. And it was an incredible race of who can blast and destroy the entire world in, 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 in a hair breadth of a second. That's, that was the, the race, who's more powerful in their thing. They decided together to cut down on their nuclear weapons, to, to dramatically diminish its production, and even to get rid of what they have, and instead to focus the monies that they're going to save, because the countries are going to save so much money and taking, taking it out of the military buildup, and to take those monies and help out poor countries that need help in various different things. So we will take that monies that we will have and we will use it for the, for, the, um, for the betterment of distributing food and distributing medical aid to poor countries in Africa and so on and so forth. This was the notion and this was the idea. So the Rebbe then at that time said that this is the fulfillment of the ultimate prophecy or one of the great prophecies that it says that are going to happen when Moshiach is coming. In the days of Moshiach, it says that Moshiach is going to rule amongst nations. V'shafat ben Amim. Once Moshiach is going to govern amongst nations, Moshiach is going to be a, an awesome king in which everybody is going to see his wisdom and all of the world is going to surrender to his judgment. So instead of nations having to ever worry that conflict is going to lead to war, is going to um, um, escalate to a war, to some kind of an aggression, 
So everybody's going to be confident that Mashiach is going to resolve all their conflicts. And as a result of that, there's no need to prepare for war. So what is going to happen, the Navi says, the people are going to take all their weapons, char bechem, their swords and all their weapons, and they're going to turn it into plowshares, which means they're going to turn it into farming equipment to help grow uh, produce. It means to help feed the planet. That's a prophecy. So the Rebbe said at that time that you should know that as a result of the sin, why did that happen? Why did that happen on Parshas Mishpatim? On Friday, Parshas Mishpatim, that's when the announcement happened. And where did it happen? In the UN, in New York. And that, that's where it took place, this agreement. So the Rebbe at that time said as follows. Since the Jewish people have completed their work already, because as the Rebbe had pointed out during that time, that in 1990, we have entered into the Messianic era. And we, the Jewish people, needed to do a certain amount of mitzvahs, a certain amount of Torah study, to purify the world, to rectify mankind, to create the, the, a, 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 a rectified human being. We've done that work already, and we've completed that work. So mankind has reached already its culmination of its completed state. Obviously, when once Mashiach will come, and there will be a powerful, powerful godly enlightenment, of course, then all the little problems that are still left over, of course, of course, I'm not saying that the world, the Rebbe never said that there isn't a criminal, there aren't petty criminals, and there aren't murderers, and there aren't the jails are still packed with people, and there's all this kind of stuff going on. But as much as we can say mankind advances on its own, as a result of Torah, before the great godly revelation. But until that time, as much as was needed, was already accomplished. Since we've already completed the job, and the Rebbe says, it's Parshas Mishpatim, and Parshas Mishpatim is, the whole theme of Parshas Mishpatim is the Torah governing the world, refining the world, through these three stages that we mentioned earlier, from the jungle state, from the criminal state, to the to that second stage where there's still the conflict and argument to the ultimate co- coexistence of Besechtas Baba Basra. Since Parshas Mishpatim is this idea, so on Friday, Parshas Mishpatim, the ultimate effect of the Jewish people is finally seen in the world. The fact that nations on their own, they're not doing it because so it says in the Bible. They're not doing it because... But the truth is on the UN building itself, the Rebbe says, is engrave that verse. The verse where it says, I think it's a verse in Isaiah, in, in uh, Isaiah, V'chatoisi char b'chem le'itim. You will cut down your swords to plowshares, and so on and so forth. So this is the fulfillment of that prophecy. And he added, the reason why it happened, this, this great phenomenon. Now you shouldn't realize that this is in all of history, See, well, we don't realize something. We take these things. Okay, so that's what happened. This is a phenomenal change, historical change. In other words, until this time, people were in a mad race to be stronger. Why? Because war is a reality. War is a very real thing, something that needs to be reckoned, something that might happen any moment. And I, so there always has to be the fact that I'm stronger than you, I'm superior to you. And, I, I, and if you dare mess with me, you know, I can, I can destroy you completely. The fact that the, 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 the leaders of the world reached that that understanding that mankind can do much better if we will take all of our monies and resources of the wealthier countries and use them to help poorer countries and so on and so forth. And we could create that utopian society where people live together in peace and in harmony. That, he says, that idea that it happened is an influence of Moshiach. And that's why he said, interesting, it happened Dafke in the city of New York. That time the Rebbe said it had to do with the fact that his father-in-law, the previous Rebbe, whose job, the Rebbe says an interesting idea, the previous Chabad Rebbe's job who came to America during that time and set up a powerful, powerful network in him and then a continuation in the seventh Rebbe that he set up this incredible network of thousands of emissaries that will go across the entire world and prepare the world for Mashiach. Get every Jew to do a mitzvah. Get even non-Jews, which was a very, very foreign idea. And many, many rabbis and many, many, many other religious Jews had a very hard time with the concept that it's our job and our obligation to affect even non-Jews to keep the seven Noahide laws. But this is one of the campaigns of the Rebbe because the Rebbe saw himself 
and his predecessor, the previous Rebbe, as those that were given the job to complete the work of rectifying all of the world and rectifying humanity. Since the Rebbe's residence is in New York, and that's where this great campaign to complete the work and rectify the world completely is in New York, so that's why that influence brought Yeltsin, or it was Gorbachev, or brought the great leaders of the world together to that messianic moment in which they signed that, 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 that pact to nullify arms and to change it. He's, he added actually another interesting idea that it happened also in the month of Shvat. It happened on the 26th day of Shvat, 26th. He says is the name of God, Yud Kevavke, is the name of the, the numeric value of the tetragrammaton of the Yud Kevavke, which is what's going to inspire people when Mashiach comes, the godly revelation of Yud Kevavke, and happening in the month of Shvat, which Shvat, he says, is the yard site of his predecessor of the previous Rebbe, and the day also that the seventh Rebbe became Rebbe, he says, so it's the influence of these tzaddikim, whose job is to complete the world, both in time and in space, in the city and in the month. And in that place, they made that, this, that, that declaration. So when I read this, of course, obviously the questions that people can have is, well, anybody that listened to the State of the Union address just uh, last week, whether you're a Trump fan or you're a Trump hater, you know, today's days is hard to find someone who's indifferent. It's one of the two. <laughs> But he clearly said that, uh, you know, we're going to build up nuclear weapons and we're going to protect ourselves. But he added an interesting line. He added a very interesting line. He said, of course we would love to have a world where we don't need this, where we don't have any worries, but as long as we have regimes like North Korea and Iran that are a threat to the stability of the world, there is no way that we can let our guard down. We have to be so powerful as the ultimate deterrent. So one can ask the question, did we regress? Was the Rebbe talking about a state where Mashiach was about to come? And now that we have a situation where we have such regimes that are a threat to the world peace, that we do need to go back to an arms race and, and build up to be kind of protected against China or against anybody else who might have some kind of an idea, is this a regression? And it bothered me in a sense. But I think, I think the answer to this because I'm very, very inspired by that talk of Parshas Mishpatim, because the Rebbe so clearly said that, take a look, the world itself and the Gentile world and the world itself has already so developed itself into the Messianic age. It's, old, it's already. But then we see that this kind of didn't keep, didn't keep up. So I think the answer is, I'm, I hope I'm right, I think the answer is like this. We had a Kodak moment. We had a moment where we flashed, where we saw Mashiach fully revealed in this world. We saw it happening, we saw it so powerful. Because another question, by the way, you can ask, and that talk the Rebbe speaks about the whole job of the UN, is to be, this, to be an entity that brings peace to the world and, brings, and creates this ultimate utopian society. But when we take a look at the UN, we see that there is so much corruption in the UN, especially when it comes to their attitude towards Israel and the attitude towards the Jewish people. So first of all, it needs to be understood that until Mashiach literally, literally comes, until that time it doesn't say anywhere that people are going to love Jews. That doesn't say. So the fact that nations of the world become more progressive and become more civilized and have ideals of world peace and that they have ideals of helping each other out, the UN did a lot of amazing things by sending uh, um, uh, peacekeeping uh, uh, things to different places, by spreading and helping food and, and doing all kinds of other humane things. These are all very, 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 very great accomplishments. Obviously, until Mashiach comes, it's not perfect, but these are great accomplishments. It doesn't say anywhere that they're going to love Jews. Once Mashiach comes and there's great light in the world and Mashiach reveals himself and everybody then realizes that all that this tremendous development in humanity came about and is a result of the difficult and, and, and incredible self-sacrifice and suffering of a people that remained loyal to God throughout all these years and slowly injected godly consciousness into mankind and, and took heat and fire all the way to the Holocaust for, for their work in this purification and their rectification. At that time, people will 
be awed and, and, and literally crazy about the greatness of Israel, the greatness of the Jewish people. You are seeing it already in certain groups within the United States that have the utmost admiration of the Jewish people in Israel. But it doesn't say anywhere that that's going to happen before Mashiach comes. What it does say is that Gentiles will start thinking in Jewish, in Jewish, in Jewish terms. Is that yeah? So, and they might not even like those that subconsciously have brought them to that state until they can fully embrace this holiness and this godliness. They might not even like, they might even feel hatred to the cause itself that's bringing them to that. That's possible. So that's something to, to understand or something to, to appreciate. What I'm going back to what I've said before, we had a very, very clear Mashiach moment. It happened in 1990, 1991, 1992. The collapse of the Soviet regime at that time, a, a collapse of a government that stood in opposition against God. It was an atheistic government and it completely dissipated and di collapsed. And a government that stood and blocked three million Jews from keeping Torah and doing mitzvahs. And as a result of that, all these th when, they, when, when that government fell and those walls, the Iron Curtain came crumbling down, millions of Jews were given permission to leave and were able to leave. And thousands of them came to the land of Israel. That too was a little snapshot. It was a little flash of kibbutz Goliath, of the Jewish people returning to the land of Israel. That was a flash. Now what's going on is the Eberster wants all that is being accomplished by the tzaddikim. All that is being accomplished by the Moshiach energy that's within this world through the tzaddik. But then, in the last, from 1992 or 19, until now, we were given the chance that even though there is a concealment and there is a, 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 a state where we don't see the powerful, powerful energies of Mashiach within the world. We don't see tzaddikim, we don't see, we're left as an orphan generation without light, without understanding. And yet, so we were given the, the opportunity to be able to assimilate these, these teachings, to be able to assimilate these ideas and appreciate the power of the Torah over the world. And for us to do those last little things that still need to be done to bring about the powerful explosion of Mashiach's light in the world and the culmination of it all. So, what I'm saying is, we came to the ultimate state of mankind being perfected, the perfection of, of, of the ultimate accomplishment of Parshas Mishpatim. We came to the very, very, very threshold of the redemption, and at that point, there was a stop, and, and right then, what we were told is, now, without the prodding from above, without the powerful leadership coming from tzaddikim from above, now you guys on your own learn these teachings, assimilate them, understand them, appreciate them, take this energy and run with it. It's up to all of us to appreciate and understand the incredible, incredible time that we're living in, the powers that's happened. Another thing I take from that talk is that we cannot look at these events that are happening amongst huge governments as just, just events, political events happening in the world, there is great godly power behind these events. And that's why I've been speaking and nonstop over the last couple of months that the president's announcements regarding to Yerushalayim, the president's activity releasing a Jew who was in jail for 27 years, commuting his sentence and letting him out early as the first person that he commuted I mean, and things like this that we've seen, the complete transformation of the UN. As we said, spoke about the UN earlier, and then the UN became basically a anti-Semitic, I don't want to use the word cesspool, but that's almost what had happened for the last 20 years. But now we have this heroic, heroic warrior in the UN, Nikki Haley, who has come in and literally completely turned around the UN. These are powerful, powerful, Moshiach developments that are happening in the world. It is so, so vital and important that we realize that Moshiach is upon us. Why is it so important? Number one, when you know Moshiach is coming, you await 
with an extra energy, with an extra yearning, because you want it to happen because you realize how close it is. That yearning is what we need. The only thing that's going to shred the gullus and finally break the exile, the grip of this, heart, of this monstrous exile that has been holding us for thousands of years is a powerful thrust within the Jewish people to the redemption. So it is absolutely vital for us to appreciate and for us to know that the redemption is here. It's not just a milla, 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 whatever, whatever you call it, away from us. It's so close. It's so close. And it's so within reach. What do we need? We need to be confident that it's happening and we need to throw ourselves in with all of our passion, all of our fervor, and all of our energy to complete the Geula so that we come and we have the complete Geula Shalema. May we merit to see it now, now, and now. So an afterthought on, and some clarification on that what has been discussed in the Shir, which I only was able to look up afterwards. Number one, the summit happened on January 31st, 1992. Uh, it is an unprecedented summit meeting of UN Security Council leaders. Uh, it was between Boris Yeltsin and uh, George Bush and uh, the French president and others. So at that meeting, it was like this. Um, the uh, President Bush called for a united effort to stop the spread of nuclear weapons. French President François uh, Mitterrand he offered French troops for UN peacekeeping efforts on a 48-hour notice, which was a big deal. Uh, but it was what really shocked everybody was the Russian president, Yeltsin. He made his request as follows. He said it was a plea for the, the United States to meld its Star Wars technology with Russians' defense expertise to protect all nations from nuclear attack with a global anti-missile shield. Yeltsin said, I think the time has come to consider creating a global system for protection of the world community. So this is very, very novel. This is very, 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 very amazing. This is a entering, a debut into the future. Um, now, regard to the question which I had brought up in the Shear, that it seems like there has been some kind of a regression because now we're back to uh, the increasing of the nuclear arsenal that has been, uh, definitely President Trump has been talking about this. So I think it's not a question. Um, I'm, I offered my explanation in this year, but I managed to, after the class, to talk to someone, a new friend of mine that I met about a few weeks ago, in which um, someone who's very well, well versed in, uh, in Torah in general and these particular talks that the Lubavitcher Rebbe gave in 1991, 1992. Um, and, over, and, and, and his explanation to me, which I really think is, makes a lot of sense, is that if you take a look in Yeshaya, in the Pasuk where it speaks about the cutting down of the arms, in Perek Beis, Pasuk Dalet. So it talks about Mashiach. And it says that Mashiach, Veshafat Bein Agoyim, Mashiach is going to rule amongst the nations. Vayichiach La'amem Rabim, and he's going to rebuke very many great nations. And as a result of that, Vechitzu Charboisam Le'itim, they're going to cut down their, their swords into plowshares. Vachani Sehem Le'mazmerois, and their spears are going to turn into uh, instruments for pruning trees. <laughs> Nations will not carry, won't raise a sword anymore against each other. <laughs> so what we have over here is like this. Mashiach is going to assure that all tyrants and all evil people are going to be ridden from the world. Now, um, in the, in, in just in recent history over the last 26 years, um, there have risen certain governments and certain terrorist threats amongst the world. We don't see that as the ultimate modern world's progression, but there is a very, very, very dangerous threat from radical Islam, from Iran, and a threat by a lunatic, uh, King Kim Jong-un from, from North Korea. Now, it, it, the, the, the initial arms race between the United States and Russia was for global power. It was who's going to be stronger. And it was a war, and, and the whole idea was these nuclear weapons was to increase one's power for destruction. That has come to an end in that, in that conference. In other words, it has been understood amongst the nations that we do not want to have weapons of mass destruction. That's not the future of humanity or the future of the world. We, we are willing to put aside our personal gains for a world peace. Now, however, there are menacing, uh, a menacing threat from various different countries. 
it is Moshiach's work to stop and rid the world, to prune the world from the last vestiges of evil that are still here. So the fact that President Trump announced last week that we have to increase our power and our might in the world so it should act as a deterrent is actually using the nuclear weapons to advance the ultimate desire of world peace. And he said it himself, as I mentioned in the class, that ideally we would like a world where there is no mass destruction, where there's no weapons, that we don't need nuclear weapons, but being that there are so and so and so, we have to be really muscle men, so they shouldn't even think of making a war. So basically this is Moshiach's work of ridding the world from the wicked, from that which is bad. So it's not chas v'sholem a regression, quite on the contrary, it's a continuation. And if you think about it, it's the opposite of the previous administration that was actually encouraging, or whether intentionally, probably unintentionally, but giving power to, a, to Iran, to someone who is a threat to the entire world at large, especially to the Jewish people. Now we see a total turnaround. So it's strength, but strength for peace, ultimate peace, and not chas um, for the idea of war. Shem who ever you keep